Welcome everyone, this is Richard Hummel, and I'm going to walk you through some of the current trends and what we're seeing with DDoS activists today. Now, I can't promise you I'm gonna have the same hype as the video you just watched, but I'll do my best. Uh, but for now, before we actually get started, a little bit of housekeeping, uh, please engage in the comments if you will. Um, in fact, I'll ask you a couple of questions and I encourage you guys to write answers. And if you're a NetScout person, you've already read this, then, then you are not authorized to respond. So uh, question number one, how many DDoS hacktivists do you think are currently active right now as of this point in time? On top of that, how many countries do you think that they're targeting with these DDoS attacks? And I'm gonna answer those about the midway point for this presentation, so stay tuned. But first, what I wanna do is get into the high level of DDoS hacktivism. What is it? Why do we care about it? What's the so what? So if I go back to, now I've been at Netscout here for about six and a half years, going on seven years. And when I first took over, there was the occasional uh, DDoS hacktivist um, that was active. They would be targeting financial services. They would go after commercial banking. You might see some DDoS extortion come around where they're saying pay us two Bitcoin or we're gonna keep coming after you. And they'll boast these massive like two terabit per second attacks that never really happen. That was DDoS hacktivism. And over time, we've seen some groups come and go. We saw go all the way back. You have Armada Collective, you have the Lizard Squad, you have Lazarus for Armada, then you had Fancy Lazarus. I mean, there's any number of these things that have come throughout the years. And, and typically there's a few of these operating at any given time. And I'm going to reveal some stuff as we go through these different um, slides that we're gonna flash up on the screen here. And I'm gonna show you just how many of these uh, are active. And I'm gonna give you the top ones, which ones are currently trending, which ones are taking this area by storm. And you're going to see that there's a lot more activity than we've ever seen before with hacktivists. And most of these guys are going to be motivated by politics. They're gonna be motivated by some sort of belief that they have. Whereas in the past, a lot of the DDoS hacktivism was related to um, just showboating often or monetary gain. Uh, often the Lazarus Baramata guys, they would go after the money. So you would see them start targeting commercial banking. They would go after the financial services industry, uh, insurance, then they started to slowly build on that before you know what they're attacking everybody. They're just trying to make a payday. But the thing is, they don't typically make a payday. In fact, there's very few people that will actually pay an extortion demand from a DDoS hacktivist. Why? Well, there's a very clear difference between hacktivism and ransomware. Now, a lot of people like to combine these things and say, it's oh, it's the same thing, but it's not. Uh, some people would call DDoS extortion as DDoS ransom. Um, and, and it's not necessarily wrong, but it's slightly different. With DDoS, you're not holding something ransom. You didn't capture data. You didn't compromise everybody's files and you're holding this or dangling this key above someone's head to decrypt your files. DDoS attacks require resources on behalf of the adversary to continually use those resources in order to keep you down. There is an end in sight. There's a recovery period coming for DDoS attacks for the most part. It's very rare that you would have a DDoS hacktivist group out there or any kind of DDoS extortionist that would have enough money, time, and resources to sustain really massive attacks that are gonna keep you down perpetually. And so there is an end in sight. So that's the difference. And so that's often why we don't see a whole lot of people paying these DDoS hacktivists for anything. And so we've shifted over time where now that a lot of the, the reasoning behind the DDoS attacks are going to be politically motivated. Geopolitics plays a huge role here. And I'm gonna show you some of that as we get to the end of this. Um, but you also see a lot of different inset beliefs. You see a lot of times the DDoS attacks will actually come in conjunction to real world events that are taking place, whether it's major sporting events, it could be elections, it could be um, there's a, somebody speaking at, in a particular country, it could be travel for various leaders of different heads of, of state. All of these things can have an impact around the DDoS hacktivist space. And so I'm gonna show you a slide now that's actually gonna show you some daily activity for just a few of these. And when you look at this, you're going to see some quite a bit of activity. Now, what you're seeing here is just the activity of what the adversary says, we have successfully taken down a website, here's the claim, here's the screenshot, here's whatever proof that they're furnishing saying we took them down. So that's what this graph is showing on a day-by-day -day basis for just a couple of the top groups. 
So you're gonna see here you have no name and anonymous Sudan. The reason why these two are listed here is because one, I wanna make a very clear distinction between the two of these. I'm gonna show you that in a few slides, but these two groups are very active and two of the most prolific groups over the time period in which we did this report. And so that's why they're here. So, but I really wanted to show just how varied it is in terms of activity. Now you see Anonymous Sudan here at the start of this time period, they were a little bit higher, but then they just tanked. And all of a sudden it's like, they're not really doing a whole lot anymore. It's not that they're not doing anything or that their attacks are not happening. It's just maybe they're not as successful as they were, or they're not claiming credit as much as they were. No Name, however, ever took over and they have sustained that high peak activity over the course of the past six to seven months. They are the number one group out there launching these attacks and these are all of their claim credit. Now, we're working on some, some additional material that we hope to come out with in the coming weeks about No Name and some of their activity. What you're seeing right here in terms of them claiming credit for attacks, it's just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more happening from this group and various other groups out there that you just don't typically see it. In fact, Anonymous Sudan, oftentimes when they go and attack somebody, they will preempt that attack by announcing it, saying, hey, we're gonna go after these 10 websites. We're gonna go after this industry. Maybe it's this whole country. We're just gonna bombard them because we don't like them. We don't like what their leaders stand for. We don't like the comments they made about whatever, insert comment here. And so they will actually do a call to arms. And what we see is the entire country often experiences surge and DDoS attacks. You'll see them across all kinds of industries, not just the five to 10 websites that they have put on their, their Telegram or their X post or whatever it might be. Oftentimes you will see the attacks expand beyond what they say they're going to do. And so Anonymous Sudan is still out there. We just don't see them claiming credit as much anymore. You have other groups out there, and we'll go to the next slide here, where we see different groups like Executor DDoS. You also have different groups like Materia Steam Bangladesh. There's Russian Cyber Army. No Name is here. Anonymous Sudan, Killnet. All of these groups, actually, Killnet is not really a thing by itself anymore. Um, it's more like a lot of these groups spawned from Killnet. So you had like Killnet come out when Russia invaded Ukraine, and then Killnet was this huge thing they had a fracturing, kind of a falling out, and you saw a lot of these different splinter cells and, and different people that may have been part of Killnet have now fractured and joined all of these other disparate groups. And so sometimes you'll see some overlap between the targeting for these various groups. So when we go and we look at all of these attacks and we see just how many websites they're targeting, right? we're talking in the hundreds. And, and I would say that this is just, again, adversaries claiming credit. That doesn't mean it's the extent of all of the websites that they've targeted. In fact, again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So while we might say there's a hundred websites in a given campaign targeted, it could be they targeted a thousand different websites or they targeted 300 different websites and 700 variations of those websites. So maybe they're going after different resources, different URLs, going after different subdomains. And so you'll see these campaigns come in, these configs come in, where they will go and try to target entire subsets of these different uh, industries or websites. And oftentimes, oftentimes, a lot of these different attacks are related directly to what you would see in geopolitics. So for instance, I've worked with a number of our customers um, who were rightly concerned when the leader of Ukraine is traveling from country to country, speaking at various events. Because what we have seen in practice is that wherever he goes and whenever he's making comments, there's typically spikes in DDoS attacks. Now, is it just DDoS attacks? Probably not. There's probably a lot of other cyber activity happening here. But the thing is, is there's a subset of these hacktivists that are monitoring what's happening there in the political space. And they are using DDoS attacks as a platform to voice their dissent. So we will see, recently we've published blogs on Poland, We've done Sweden, we've done Finland. I, I have a couple of blogs out there around NATO. Uh, we just recently uh, put out some stuff on X about uh, South Korea. Uh, we're working on a blog for that one. We're currently examining Romania right now. And so there's all these different countries right now that are experiencing these attacks. And then you have the European elections all over the place. All of these countries where the elections are taking place, DDoS attacks are surging. And these hacktivists have actually banded together 
and there was a uh, cyber dragon, I think is the name of the group, um, says that there's this group um, of banded together people going and targeting different aspects of geopolitics because they don't agree with them or they say the countries are, are um, doing their politics or doing their decisions based on Russophobia. They don't like Russia or anything to do with Russia. Or they're scared of Russia. And so now all of these different groups are going to band together to go target those particular countries or industries or, or offices or whatever that just don't agree with their politics. And so we've seen this more and more. And same thing happened with the European elections and various groups, including No Name 57, who we're examining here, actually said, we're going to go after, systematically go after and target these things in conjunction with the elections because we don't agree with a lot of these different political parties. And so that happens time and time again throughout the entire course of, of the life cycle of uh election or runoff elections. We've seen this even in Latin America, where um, I want to say it was, so I'll have to look at it again, but it's it's um, not Puerto Rico, um, that's the US side, but on the Latin American side, there was a particular election, and I think this is in the threat report, actually, if you go and look at some of the geopolitics section, you can see that there was very contested um, election happening. And there's two different rival parties. And one of the rival parties was set to take over. And a lot of people were protesting that. And so what you would see is you would see the election take place. You'd see a peak in DDoS attacks. It would ebb a little bit. And then you would see a protest. And that protest was very much in contention. And then you would see it die off again. And then you'd see the runoff election. Once again, you would see a peak in DDoS attacks. And it basically followed the trend of exactly what was happening in that country from a political unrest situation. And I find that extremely intriguing when you are able to literally put a pin on something that we're seeing in the digital landscape and point back to something that's happening in the real world. That's really, really cool. So I asked you earlier on how many of these groups are out there? How many countries are we talking about here? And I want to give you the scope of scale here because I've talked about the hacktivism here and the different geopolitics here, but I want to show you just the scale and scope of this. So right now, there are more than 250 different DDoS hacktivist groups out there, all operating and launching attacks consistently. Now, do every single one of these groups launch an attack every single day? Probably not. But in a six month period of time, there are 289 different adversaries out there claiming to launch DDoS attacks in a hacktivist nature. Now, some of these groups are varied all over the place. So Executor DDoS, I mentioned them earlier, they target a lot of different industries, a lot of different countries. There's another one called SN Black Meta right now that's targeting places all over the, uh, across the US and the UK and France and, and just everywhere. 101 different countries are experiencing these attacks. Now, there's 196 um, actual countries in the world, 250 plus countries and territories. So 101, we're talking greater than 50% of the recognized countries in the world getting DDoS attacked by DDoS hacktivists for one reason or another. So this is not an isolated problem. This is not a European problem. This is not a NATO problem. It's not a Russia-Ukraine conflict problem. This is a global phenomena, a global problem that all of us are having to deal with across the board. I can go to any one of our service provider customers and I can talk to them and we can literally go and pinpoint when they would have received DDoS hacktivist uh, attacks because they're just everywhere and they're all over the place. So what's the difference between these two groups? Now I've got a slide here that's gonna show you these two different groups here. Um, and I really wanted to showcase these two primarily because they're so different. They're varied in what they do, their sophistication, the technology that they use um, and how they go about doing their targeting. So I already mentioned non anonymous Sudan a little bit. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time there to break them out a little bit. These guys, from what we can tell, they're not very sophisticated. They might do a little extra work to identify their targets, maybe do a little bit of reconnaissance. But like I said, they, they globally announce who they're going to go after before they do it. So when it's time to actually launch the attacks, who knows how many hundreds or thousands of possible people they've roped into this to launch these attacks. And the thing is, is that the technology they're using to launch these things, it's been around for decades. They're using DDoS for hire services. There are more than 350 DDoS for hire services that are a button click away 
when you go to underground marketplace. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. And the thing is, is most of the attack vectors that Anonymous Sudan are responsible for in their attacks, you can actually launch for free. You can go into a DDoS for hire service, you can put an IP address in there, you can put a URL or domain in there, and you can hit a button that says, I want to test the DNS reflection amplification against this site. And then you can push the button. And you can do that for DNS, you can do it for NTP, for CLDAP, sometimes you can do it for TCP SYN floods. And the adversary is making call to arms to the entire criminal underground saying, if you agree with our reasoning for launching these attacks, join us here, essentially go in, find a DDoS for hire service, put these addresses in there and hit a button. That's all they have to do. And now you have this group here, not sophisticated, that is weaponizing their political ideology here and taking all of these different people to try to launch attacks and take down their, their opponents. So less sophistication, more call to arms type action. On the flip side of this, you have the group like No Name 57. They have gamified their entire platform. So what they have done is made a call to, to action in the criminal underground, but they don't just say, join us and spend your own resources. They say, no, here's our Didaja code that we've written. I want you to deploy this. And when you deploy it, we're going to track how much activity we can launch from it, how many attacks we can launch, what's the scale of those attacks, and we are going to pay you for that. So they have monetized this. Now, think about it. If you have a criminal underground that is incentivized by any kind of earnings, this is the DDoS hacktivism of old, who wouldn't want to do this? They don't have to do anything. They don't have to take the responsibility on themselves. It's not like they have to stand up a node in their house. They can go find a bulletproof hosting provider. They can go abuse uh, public cloud hosting, sign up for free accounts. They can do any number of ways to deploy this Didaja code. And then they give access to the actual uh, DDoS hacktivist group and they will launch attacks through it. If their infrastructure gets taken down, great. I'm going to go find another one. I'm going to go find another one. And the more attacks that can be launched through that node, the more points they get for this custom digital currency that no name offers for them to go and then spend somewhere in the underground marketplace. So they've weaponized that by gamifying the entire system. And the criminal underground is huge. It operates very effectively as a well-oiled industry, essentially. And so you will have many, many people trying to do this. And they're going to be incentivized to find infrastructure that is, one, cheap for them, but also highly resilient because they want to have more and more attacks launched from that infrastructure. So they will use things, like I mentioned, cloud public cloud hosting providers. They'll go and abuse free signup accounts. They'll find bulletproof hosting providers that don't listen to takedown attempts or that it's extremely resilient in nature. So all of these things go hand in hand to show this. So what does this look like on the political stage? Let's show the last slide here. And I'm just showing you a few different countries here that how all of this activity can impact an entire country. So we are talking about DDoS attacks for both Russia and Ukraine here and Palestine and Israel. Now, I don't care which group it is. I don't care who the target is. I've merged these so you don't actually know which is which. But it just shows you when a conflict takes place, when there's a political move, when there is something happening here, it affects the entire country. It affects DDoS attacks everywhere. And DDoS attacks cause collateral damage. You take down one service provider, you take down one authoritative DNS server, and you have this domino effect of everybody using that being impacted as well. So this is a global problem, it's a global phenomenon, and it is something that we all need to rally around to understand that this DDoS hacktivist stuff, it's out there, it's alive, it's well, and it's causing problems. So we need to come together, work together to solve this problem. Thank you for attending us today. I hope you stay tuned. We plan to do some more of these in the future. So thank you for attending. And uh, we'll get to any comments you have in the discussions as time goes on.